to allocate memory, uh, a typical memory allocation within a process would use the Windows API function virtual alloc. Now, this can be an IOC concern. Uh, there are techniques which look for pages of virtual memory allocated without a backing image file from disk, which I just alluded to, uh, i.e. memory scanners. Uh, a possible alternative to this for fun is to use a process heap instead. Now, you can do this in the same process, uh, and the code I'm going to show you actually uh, does this. Well, how do we create a heap in the same process using the Windows API? Well, we can use the MSDN calls or the Windows API calls, heap create, and then heap alloc. The one thing that is required here is when we use heap create, we have to set the flag enable execute because we are going to put code on this and we need that heap to be able to execute code. All memory blocks, it says in the thing here, that are allocated from this heap allow code execution. If the hardware enforces data execution, prevention. Use this flag in applications that run code from the heap. That's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to set it with the heap create enable execute. Here are the Python function prototypes to do exactly that. So heap create, uh, we've looked them up on MSDN. We equals ctypes.windll.kernel32.heap create. Heap create arg types, we set that to a double word, a size t, which is an integer essentially, and another size t integer. And then the return type from a heap create is going to be a Windows handle, which is essentially a pointer to that new heap that we just created. Heap alloc takes also three arguments. It takes the handle for the heap that we've created. Uh, it takes a double word and it takes an integer and the return type from heap alloc is a void pointer. Now, of course, we can always look up on MSDN the actual arguments that are required. I didn't include them in this slide, but I'll leave that uh, for your reading uh, later. Uh, shellcode itself. To generate the shellcode, well, an easy favorite, and I love doing this in demonstrations, Metasploit is so reliable with shellcode generation. There's so many great examples. One of the most trivial and easy example in Metasploit is to generate a command shellcode using the exec module and execute a calculator or execute a notepad or just execute a Windows command. It's a really nice visual way to prove that your uh, shellcode executed. And we can use one of the transform formats to format the output from the MSF Venom command such that uh, we have it compatible with the language that we're um, writing in. And so there is, in fact, a Python transform format. And so we can create just unencoded shellcode, no encoder required, because we don't want to do that. Plain old, let's execute a calculator as 64-bit shellcode with this particular command. Now, another step that we need to do inside of our uh, script is copy the shellcode into the memory that we are going to allocate on that heap. Well, there is another function call that's very useful called RTL move memory. And RTL move memory is also, uh, it's, it stands for runtime library, move memory. It's also part of the kernel 32 DLL uh, exported function list. And so we can set up our function prototype in Python to call RTL move memory. And the resulting uh, uh, return type from this is uh, an LP void as well. Essentially, this is just like a mem copy command in C, if you like. You're providing it a destination, a source address, and then the number of bytes that you actually want to copy. Finally, we can use kernel 32's create thread and then after that, wait for a single object to block and wait on the thread uh, to complete. When we do that, we have all the parts of the script we need for actual success. So what I want to now show you is the actual Python script that puts all these parts together. So script part one, this is not an exact copy of the script. Uh, I'll show you later. I've implemented some process injection for you as well. But what I wrote is a Python script that has a class in it called shellcode execute. And the very first part of the script is simply uh, the class definition and then a couple of variables with shellcode in them. And the shellcode are the x86 or 32-bit version of the calculator command, uh, as well as the 64-bit version of the calculator command. 
are generated from MSF Venom. The next part of the script in the shellcode execute class are all of the required parameters. These are constants, right? As well as the function prototypes that I'm going to use when I actually perform the shellcode execution in the same Python process. Right now we're covering same Python process, not process execution. So I have a constant for heap create enable execute that is copied directly from MSDN. I have a constant for heap zero memory, which is also copied directly from MSDN. And then I have the appropriate function prototypes all laid out in the uh, script as attributes of that class before we even get to the init and the actual function execution part itself, right? Then in the initialization method in the class, we actually have a little bit of detection uh, logic here. It's uh, looking for if the shellcode is none and the platform architecture is 64-bit, then uh, set the uh, shellcode variable to the 64-bit version of Python. Actually, there's an error there that probably should say is not none instead of none, but it actually works anyway. I need to correct that. Else, let's set the shellcode variable to the x86 version of the shellcode. And then let's call a function called execute. And as you might imagine, the execute function is going to perform the actions of creating the heap, copying the shellcode into the heap, then creating the thread of execution and waiting for that thread to complete. Here's the actual shellcode execution. And like you might think after all that explanation that I went through, that this function in Python was going to be incredibly complex. But it turns out that once you have thought through everything that you need to do here very carefully in terms of the Windows API, the code itself is not very complex. So here we have heap equal equals self dot heap create. We provide the heap create enable execute flag and the length of the shell code is the second parameter. And then the third parameter just needs to be a zero. And I can't remember, I'd look on MSDN, but I think the third parameter uh, is some other flag parameter that doesn't matter. So we don't need to provide it anything. Then heap alloc with that heap pointer, zero the memory and also allocate the heap with the length of the actual shell code. Now the shell code's about 300 bytes long. Uh, because of the way the Windows API works, it's going to allocate a heap that is a page of memory regardless, which will be 4,096 bytes. So I could have easily just rounded that up, uh, but LAN of shell, uh, shell code is going to work because NTDLL will round it up after the kernel 32 function actually calls NTDLL anyway. Then we copy the heap to the heap, the actual shellcode bytes and the number of bytes we're going to copy. No big deal, right? That's just a memory copy. And then we create the thread. Now, again, there are a number of flags you can provide with the create thread call, but all we care about is that the starting address of the heap is supplied to create thread. All of the other flags, which again are documented on M MSDN, can be set to zero because they're actually irrelevant. And then we just wait for a single object, which is waiting on that thread handle to complete. And in the case of a calculator shellcode, it's only executing a single command, and then the shellcode is finished with its job. So we won't be waiting long. And in fact, the Python process itself will actually exit after that. Let's do a quick demo of that because why not? Just to prove to you that um, I'm, I'm not lying. So here we have our Python execute, uh, Python shellcode uh, directory. And here's our shellcode execute script, just like I said, it's all written out there. And in fact, I've enhanced the script with a little bit of logic down here to determine whether we're doing in-process execution or a process injection. And I'll talk about the pro process injection in a minute. But if we scroll up, you can see the same execute method is inside of that script as I just talked about on the slide. And by the way, because I'm a nice guy, I'm going to be supplying this script to you because we like to provide lots of good value when we do webcasts at Black Hills, right? 
So to execute this thing, I execute a Python process with shellcode.py, and then I can use help here uh, because we're using the argument parsing module, right? Uh, and we have method zero, which is e execute the shellcode in the same process. And we have method one, which is inject into a remote process. We're just going to use zero and execute it. And look, a calculator, right? Now, listen, folks, I want to tell you right now, okay, I know that was sort of anticlimactic, but this is a fully instrumented, fully patched Windows system running regular Windows Defender. Did you see Defender jump up and down and scream and shout? Not at all, right? It just went ahead and executed the shellcode. No problem at all, okay? Fantastic. That's what we want to see. But wait, the shellcode might be detected. ruh -roh. You might run into problems with the shellcode itself. The sequence of bytes can be seen as malicious from a static analysis perspective. It wasn't seen as malicious in this demo, but it could, right? So we have some options to consider. We could use encryption in the shellcode generation. We could use some form of encoding in the shellcode generation, or we could write some DIY encryption with Python and encrypt the shellcode into the script and decrypt it right before we inject it into memory. And I actually prefer that last option rather than using some sort of shellcode encoder, because there are some ramifications of using a shellcode encoder from the perspective of what it does in terms of tying our hands on the uh, uh, execution side, particularly when you're process injecting. And I'll, I'll chat a little bit about that before we finish out. Good old XOR. The mathematical exclusive OR function can be used for symmetric encryption. In fact, it is the basis of the RC4 encryption algorithm. It is the first encryption algorithm that was commonly used for symmetric encryption uh, before we you know, came across things like AES. And we didn't just come across them. We had some really good mathematical research that actually came up with the AES symmetric cipher. But XOR is a perfectly reasonable symmetric encryption mechanism. If you take a single character, you convert it to a byte, you XOR it with the key, and then you take that ciphertext or the cipher byte, if you like, XOR it with the same key, presto, you get back the original byte. So XOR works quite wonderfully as a very simple encryption algorithm. Now, there's another Python module out there from the scientific computing world uh, called NumPy or NumPy. I don't know however you pronounce that. And NumPy is backed by some C libraries, which makes it very high performing. Uh, in fact, it's designed that way as a high performance scientific computing package. Now, one of the things that Python suffers from when you're doing mathematical operations on large arrays of data, Python slows down a lot. It has a performance challenge because it has to interpret that code, put it into bytecode, execute the bytecode each time around a loop, and it just takes a long time. And I learned this actually because some of the internal code I have at Black Hills, we were trying to encrypt some uh, shell code that was nine or 10 megabytes in length. And Python was just unbelievably sh slow in doing it. I've switched this over to NumPy Bitwise XOR for the encryption. And wouldn't you know it, it worked beautifully and it worked beautifully literally in one function call. So an XOR string method is what I've written here and included into this script that will literally encrypt your shellcode array with a string key of arbitrary length and return the ciphertext. Well, that's very, very useful, right? So to accompany this, we need some sort of standalone Python encryption script so that on the at the time we generate the shellcode or obtain the binary shellcode, we can encrypt it before placing it into our target script. Well, how would we do this? Now, the easiest way is to write something that's very basic that either reads a file or just takes standard input from another process, it goes ahead and encrypts all the data and then just spits out a brand new Python array uh, 
with your encrypted shellcode. And, uh, you know, by doing this, we would have a lovely uh, encrypted version of the shellcode. In fact, I can even uh, demo that, ooh, I think. Well, actually, uh, I'll come to that at the end. We'll see, we'll see how we go. So that would be how we would deal with it, right? And here's an example of me doing it. I just used a generic Ubuntu box that I used for sort of kicking around development. I ran MSF Venom on it, used the same command, a 64-bit exec module, calculator.exe, but this time used the raw format, piped it into my XOR me script, and I didn't supply a key because it defaults to a key string of encrypt me or something really dumb like that. But you can supply a key if you want. And then it just spits out the encrypted version of the raw bytes in a Python form, which you can then paste back into your uh, Python script. I'm going to demo that right at the end. I'm going to move on to process injection before we uh, talk about the encryption uh, from a demo perspective. So what about process injection? Should we try in our Python script now, now that we have our wheels, right? We're like, okay, we've written this code. We've put it together. The Windows API is working. I'm using kernel 32 to do this stuff. Why don't we try to process inject? Because isn't it more fun to be able to find a process that the user owns target that process, open a process handle, shove the shellcode into that process and make that process execute the shellcode uh, instead of uh, having our Python interpreter hanging around. All right, sure. There are lots of potential techniques. Again, we're going to stay old school, which is exactly what I just described. And that is just opening a process with minimal rights that we need, allocating some virtual memory in that process, copying the shellcode over to that new memory segment, and then telling that remote process, hey, go, go ahead and create a new thread, All right? Now, I can almost guarantee you, if you do this on a system that has an EDR on it, you will get busted, All right? So don't get your expecta expectations up too high. And I'm talking even in a Python script, you're going to get busted, right? So, because this is old school process injection. This, this is something that's been around for a long time. But... For a standard consumer-grade off-the-shelf antivirus, you're probably not going to get busted. What about the process that we need to target? Well, the fun part about this is we can write a Python function to search out and locate a process of interest using a Python package called psutil. So PSUtil is not by default included with Python. And so in the scenario described where you just have a generic Python interpreter, you may not have PSUtil available to you. Hence, you go back to the in Python process technique, right? But if you do have PSUtil available to you, you can write a function that looks a little bit like this. And I wrote the, you uh, this function and I'm going to give it to you. This function uh, first of all, looks up your username on the target system by using the environment variables, user domain and username, and then just creating that username format using the backslash between the domain name and the actual username. And then what it does is it loops through all of the processes in the Windows system looking or trying to get the process name and the process username itself. Now, to get the process username, it's going to have to examine the process and the security token, which means it's probably going to open a process handle. In fact, I guarantee you it will open a process handle. And so I have what's called an exception handler here so that when we try to grab that username, if we try to grab it for a privileged process, it'll actually go to the next iteration of the loop so that we won't break our script. If it finds a process that matches the user owner that we're running under our Python script and the process name matches the preferred name we're looking for, maybe that servicehost.exe, then it will add that process ID to a list of candidates. And then this function in Python will return that candidate by random selection. And thus we have a fairly nice randomized way 
to find candidate processes or single process, should I say, to inject in uh, Python. What about the injection API call sequence? Well, here's the sequence of kernel 32 DLL API calls that we need to perform a relatively intelligent remote process injection. We need to open the process handle to the chosen PID after we find it. We need to allocate memory inside that process that we opened, and that is using that remote or foreign process handle. We need to write our shellcode into that target memory, re-protect the target memory as read execute, then create a remote thread of, uh, thread of execution and close the process handle. And that forces that remote process to spin up a thread for shellcode execution, thus achieving our remote shellcode execution that we are after. You may ask, why did I allocate the memory as read-write in the chosen PID and then change it over to read-execute later? Well, that's a little trick I learned, which may not work as well today. It used to work a few years back pretty well, and I kept it in the arsenal. That helps with evasion. If you have a memory segment in a process that is read-write and execute, It is a very obvious indicator, especially if it's not backed by a disk image of any kind, that there's probably malicious activity going on. But you can get a little bit of evasive value if you change that uh, protection to just read and execute. So I use two-step operation here. I initially allocated as read-write through the shellcode into the memory, then moved back to read-execute before I actually created the thread. And with any luck, that memory page now will look a little more innocuous and blend in with some of the other virtual memory pages in that process. Now, the downside of this is it's not backed by a disk image. And so there is still that memory scanner risk that exists there, because as we all know, the EDRs are getting very good. The other downside of this which a lot of people get hung up on, and we have seen a lot of pretty talented researchers beat their heads against monitors and get very frustrated, is you cannot use self-modifying shellcode. By that, I mean is if the shellcode tries to write back to the same memory segment that you've allocated and the permissions on that segment are just read and execute, you're going to throw an exception and the process is probably going to die. Another way of saying that is don't use something like an MSF Venom encoder because that is self-modifying shellcode. Don't use MSF Venom encryption because that's self-modifying shellcode. That's the rub. It's a compromise here that you need to be aware of. 